Hey Solid Rock youth, friends, and family, what a blessing to be able to share with you. This video that you're about to watch is how to effectively tell your story, to tell the story of how Jesus came into your life. Now this is not just for Solid Rock youth. You can use this same material to be able to craft your own story and I would encourage you to do so. If you're a parent of one of the students in Solid Rock youth, I would encourage you to take some time today to get together and share your own story. Go through the same work that your student's going through. I think you would find the time really fruitful. If you are looking for the handout that I gave to the students, you can send me a message and I'd love to send you uh, the material to put, put that together. So I pray that you're blessed and we will see you on Wednesday, January 13th for history finding your place in his story. We are drawn to story. Story matters to us because story is who we are. What has happened in the past and where we are going defines us as a human race. Entertainment cannot compensate for good story. We see ourselves in the stories of redemption, pain, struggle, and hope. We all long for others to read the story of our lives that we are daily writing. In our solitude, we all ask the same question about our story. Who am I? Where do I belong? What do I believe? Do I have what it takes? We're all asking this question, what makes our story matter? Billions of people have lived before me. What makes me special? Why should anyone care? Every individual that has lived over the course of human history have all been a part of not billions of stories, but one man's story. He created every one of us, and we all tried to hijack his story. We trashed his creation in our joyride to find purpose apart from it. Then he, Jesus, came into the world. He became one of us to die for us, to save us from ourselves. He reconciles us again back to his story. Each of our stories are a part of his goodness. If you take a picture of the grandest mountain, the picture is not the object of beauty, just the unique display of the mountain's grandeur to a world that is not privileged to see it personally. Millions of photographers could take a picture of the same mountain and all have different presentations of its beauty but it is the mountain's beauty that makes the picture beautiful. All of our stories are snapshots or a picture of his beautiful story. At Solid Rock Youth, we are learning to find our place in his story. Let's capture the beauty of his story with our lives. Um, all right, I'm gonna get started anyway. All right, don't mind, don't, don't mind the man in the room walking around. What does the word testimony mean? If I was telling you tomorrow, um, I can't hang out with you because I have to go testify in court, what would I be saying when I say testify? Josiah. Kind of telling your life story, but, uh, if you're a Christian, it's a your life story as a believer. Okay, life story as a believer, okay. Testimony, like what when a when a witness witnesses something, they go and give testimony. What are they doing? Yeah, exactly right. So it, there's there's an objective part of it too, but it's mostly like a subjective thing where it's it changes from person to person. Now all of us who have accepted Jesus all have experienced the same objective reality, meaning it doesn't change from person to person. You guys know what objective means? We're gonna do a whole series on this at one point. But objective basically means it doesn't change from person to person. It's, it's true always, no matter what, okay? So there's a piece for each one of us, objectively, we all who have accepted Christ have experienced the same thing. But at the same time, we've all had subjective experiences of that same salvation, right? Like my story is not the same as your story 
but it's the same Savior who saved me the same way. Okay? We all have this common bond in that way. So it says in Hebrews chapter 11, 5, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So what was Enoch's testimony? Just said it. That he did what? He was pleasing to God, right? That's his story. That's who he was. So your testimony is kind of a statement of identity. Um, it's how you see the world. It's your experiences. It's what people know you for. Um, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, he's speaking of all these people, idolaters, homosexuals, liars, cheaters. He goes through this list and he says, as were such some of you. Meaning that this is who you used to be, but this is not who you are anymore. You've been changed. So what can a personal testimony accomplish? What can it accomplish? Knowing your testimony. What can that do? Why would that be important might be a better way to ask it. Why is it important that you know how you received Jesus? Why do you think that's important? Because then we'll be closer to him. Be closer to him? Okay, good. It's a constant reminder of what he's done in our lives and not just all the time. Yeah, that's and a good People can also make that forgiveness personal. Exactly, that's very good. Josiah. Better understanding. Better understanding, very good. What else? Patty? You can learn things. Do you have your hand up now? Okay, so there's a list of things why your testimony is good. I like what Revelation chapter 12 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. How many of you guys don't know your Bible very well? Raise your hand, because I know some of you guys are like, yeah, that was me. Like, I grew up in the church, but I like, if someone was like, could you tell me right now, like, how to become a Christian, like, and then, like, explain it to you, like, I wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, I know, like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I, even at this point, when I get around other pastors, I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't know my Bible that well. Like, I, I feel like I know it way better than I used to do, but I'm still growing in it. But do you know the one thing I know for sure is how Jesus saved me and how he came into my life? And when the enemy comes into my life, I can know that foundation of that personal relationship I have with him. Just like I know me and my wife's love story. Could you imagine if someone was like, well, what's your guys' story? And we're like, oh, we don't really have a story. Like, I just, we've just always been together. Like, we just came together and we're like together now. And you're like, well, then why'd you get married? And you're like, well, I don't know. Like, I like her. I like, so our families were friends and like it just happens like and, but that's what we do with our christian walk don't we we're like i don't know when i became a christian i don't know why i'm a christian i don't really know what happened in my life but this is supposed to be the most significant love story the most significant person in your life and you can't identify how he's impacted you we're talking about the god of the universe the created giraffes and dolphins and like pterodactyls with a P, right? All those things. That's who, who created you and died on the cross for you so you could be in a relationship with them. That should affect us, right? Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. This is like by far my favorite passage to teach youth. Because it was insanely transformational for me when I was your guys' age. Ephesians 2. There's three things that I want you to remember. Who you once were. How God changed you. And now who he's making you to be today. Right? So your past, the conversion experience, and who you are today. That's the three pieces of your testimony, right? And if, in, in Ephesians chapter 2... It gives us all three pieces of a test, everyone's objective testimony that we all have. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in trespasses 
and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Who were you before? Who were you before? Just read it. You're dead, right? You're walking according to the course of the world. The Bible tells you you were lost. You were stuck in darkness. You were not a people. You were slaves. You were blind. You were all these things. That's who you were before Christ, right? And then we get down to verse 8. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So you were lost. You didn't know where you were. You had no assets within yourself to save yourself. You were lost in a sea without shore. You had no hope. You were drowning. And Jesus came in. Not because you were good, but because he is good. And all you had to do was take a hold of Jesus. And he came into your life. Saved you. He, take, he took you from darkness into light. He ter- took you from a slave to a friend. He take, took you from someone who was lost, but someone who is now found. Someone who was once dead, but now is alive. All You could just go through the New Testament of how that change took place. But it's through God's grace. I've been thinking a lot about this. I'm reading this book that has just transformed my whole amount of thinking. I'm going to have the readers read it eventually. But it's called Show Them Jesus. And in this book, he talks about the people who need the gospel the most really is Christian kids. Kids who grew up in the church. Because, you know, like when you've been out in the day and it's like super sunny and someone takes out like a billion, zillion like lumens flashlight and they flash it around in the middle of the day, right? Nobody notices that, right? Because the sun is drowning it out at that moment. But if I were to take this flashlight that I have in my pocket and, no, I'm not going to flash it with the light, but it would be blinding, right? Because it's a little dark in this room. For many Christian kids, you guys have been so inoculated, so used to hearing the gospel over and over and over that you have forgotten how powerful it really is. You have, have lost the understanding of how deep this is. Every one of you guys in the next two weeks are going to be working on your personal testimony, your personal story of how Jesus saved you. But I can guarantee you, all of us have had the same depth of saving take place, whether we realize it or not. Some of us don't even realize it because we think, oh yeah, it was pretty good. Like I grew up in church. I haven't done this, 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 and this. So Jesus only had to die for like a little sin. Like that dude over there that's the pastor man, he had a lot of sin and he's really old. So like Jesus had to love him more. No, false. All of us, all of us were lost and without hope and Jesus saved us. But everyone has a little bit different story and that's what's so beautiful about it. It's this tapestry. Now, um, our, our, our series is called Finding Your Place in his story or finding your place in history. Why did I do that? Well, because your testimony is not your story. I mean, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, you don't have to. Those who can memorize it, what does that verse say? In the beginning. In the beginning, I need one more word. God. God. In the beginning, God. So did it say... In the beginning, Chad, or in the beginning, Abby, or in the beginning, Nolan, or in the beginning, Bethany. You know, it it didn't say that, did it? No, it said, in the beginning, God. And then man comes up on the show, and like, so, I'll show you really fast. I have that little introduction part, so it's, I'm having a hard time finding Genesis. Okay, so here's Genesis 1, and I have extra notes. Okay, and then here's Genesis 2, and Genesis 3, and man sins. Okay, so there's where God introduces the world, and then the rest is all about God coming to fix it. 
and then at the end, it being fixed again, right at the end, right? It's his story. We, we play a part in it, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful redemption story about how each person individually that's come to Christ, how he's changed us completely. I would not be the person I am today without Jesus. I would be without a hope without him. So I want you to remember it's his story. Then this is one of my favorite verses for you. If you guys are depressed or struggling with finding purpose in your life, Ephesians 2.10 is so good. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Like, boom! I could just, just right there. Like, it's so good. But I know you guys don't under, you're not as excited as I am because I've been thinking about it for a while, so... I'll give you that. But by next week, I hope you're just as excited about Ephesians 2.10. This is why it's so exciting. God says you're his workmanship, poema. You are his poem. You are his piece of art. You are specially designed by him. And then he says, I've created a purpose for you that no one else in the world can fulfill like you can. It's like a Torix bit, if you guys know what that is. Like you're like, oh man, Phillips will not work. Oh, Allen wrench will not work. Like you have to get the perfect, especially the security ones with the little hole in the center or like when you have to take your iPhone apart. None of you guys know what I mean. It's a star bit. So like just in the same way, you guys are all star bits and only you as God's perfect, I don't want to call you a tool, but yeah, as that, you are the only one that can, can fill that purpose. You're the only one that can do it. No one can be sister like you can be sister. No one can be daughter like you can be daughter. No one can be brother, friend. God has made you unique. It doesn't mean that he won't use somebody else if you don't fulfill your purpose. But God, he saved you for a purpose. You were lost. Point number one, Jesus saved you when you had no assets. And now that he saved you, he's given you a purpose something to do. That's our story. That's how we're going to be breaking it up. Okay, so I want to share my story real fast, and I'm probably going to really botch it, so that will make you guys feel way better about doing it You're on your own. Um, so I was born in 1986. Uh, my mom uh, got pregnant with me um, out of wedlock. She didn't have a husband, and uh, one day she was feeling really sick, um, and so she went to the doctor's office. Nurse came in, says, you're pregnant. I'm going to give you a moment to think about what you want to do with this baby. And um, the Lord spoke to my mom and said, I want you to keep this baby audibly. And then my mom spoke to the nurse and said, I just, like, this, I heard this voice, and and he's, I, I'm supposed to keep this baby, and this this nurse was a Christian, and led my mom to the Lord right there in the doctor's office. So that's how I was first introduced to the Lord, was through my mom. And that's how I, I kind of kind of was brought into the church. And my mom was, was a children's ministry uh, director. My dad's a worship leader, so I've been in the church. So a lot of us understand that. But when I was four years old, I went to Wild Bill's. VBS Vacation Bible School. And the man went up there and he said, Now, if anyone wants to give their heart to Jesus, just raise your hand. And so the girl next to me, little Samantha, I was only I was I was four years old, but a real lady killer. And I was like, I think she was cute, call her Sammy. She, she, you know, we played hopscotch together and stuff. <laughs> little Sammy raised her hand, and I was like, she's raising her hand. I'm gonna do what she wants to do. And so I raised my hand. My motives were not pure. I was barely cared what Wild Bill said. And then he goes, now, there's going to be some adults, and they're going to lead you out into another room. So I go into this other room. There's those, like, blinds where the light shines through, and it's kind of dark. And I remember it's this older lady, and I'm like, why am I in this room, in the dark room? My mom warned me about this. All those kind of things. And she starts to share with me the gospel. And she says, Jesus died for your sins. And in that moment, I could literally picture Jesus on the cross. I didn't know what his face looked like and all of that. But I knew that the Son of God paid the price for me. And at four years old, that drastically hit me. And I remember the feelings I had at that moment. 
In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I would like to say that at four, year, at four years old, I just like continued and I killed it. Like I never sinned again. I was like the perfect child. Um, and, you know, people came just to touch the hem of my garment or something like that. That did not happen. <laughs> I wasn't what your typical sinner, though, was. I was the church kid that didn't do that many bad things. In the eighth grade, I got a girlfriend. She became my god. My parents told me to break up with her multiple times. I said no. I hid it. I lied. And finally, when I was in the eighth grade, I ran away from home the night before Mother's Day. Real jerk move. And then the Lord got hold of me later in high school. And in my 12th grade year, I felt called to the ministry. And I was like, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you. But then I met my wife, and everything changed. And I was going to go to Africa, and I was actually going to go with Abigail's dad and mom to Africa and serve with them, which was really weird when I moved here. And then the Lord brought me into youth ministry at 19 years old. I mean, there was kids that were the same age in my youth group when I started youth ministry. It was a huge step. And life was really good until 2019 when my sister-in-law had a catastrophic stroke and lost her whole life ability to use her whole uh, right side of her body to be able to speak. Her eyes did not track. We didn't know if she was going to make it. It was really hard, a really, really hard year. We were driving back and forth between San Diego and Borrego, which is an hour and a half, a couple times a week. I didn't have my wife. I'm working, still trying to do youth ministry and all that. And I remember I was just feeling so distant from the Lord, and we're driving up to go see Megan, and I came to this point where I was like, God, I know you're real, but I just feel like you're not speaking to me. Like you're not, you're not present. You know what I mean? Like where you like, you're like, where are you? And my kids were like, hey, let's just send Christian radio. I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. And um, there was a song by Casting Crowns, and they said, if your eyes on their storm are on the storm, you'll wonder if I love you still, but if your eyes are on the cross, you'll know I always have and always will. And in that moment, the Lord was like, you might not hear me, but see me. See me on the cross with my arms stretched out, and I was brought back to when I was four years old again. And the gospel hit me in such a deep way. You guys, when I came here, I came here for mostly the motivation I wanted to grow as a man, as a pastor, But when I came here with Pastor Matt, he has such a love for the gospel. I have fallen in love with Jesus in a deeper way than I have never, ever imagined. I've learned so much about how deep his love for us is. That when we sin, Jesus is drawn even the more to us. That he pursues us. You know, as as growing up in the church, I always thought, when I sin, I'm separated from God. But do you remember what, what happened in the garden in Genesis 3, when Adam was in his sin, it says, and then God was walking in the garden. And he said, Adam, where are you? He came in Adam's sin, and he sought him out. Jesus has sought me out. That's my story. That's my story about how I've grown for this love. That took five minutes. That's how long I want you guys to take when you do your testimony, okay? So let's start going through some practical sides of it. And then we're going to move forward, okay? So today we're going to break uh, in about 10 minutes. I'm going to give you guys some more details. The last, we have 20 minutes before your parents pick you up, okay? The last 10 minutes, I'm going to break you into your small groups so you can get to know the people that are going to be kind of helping you through this. Um, And then you can ask questions there once we get to our different small groups. Next week, you're going to give your testimony to your small group. Okay, you don't have to come up here and do it. Okay, in three weeks, we're gonna have about six to eight kids do it up here. Okay, so be praying about that if that's you, if the Lord's leading you to do that. Okay, Um, but next week, everyone's gonna be sharing their story. Now, maybe some of you realize, like, I don't have a testimony. Listen, if you have accepted Jesus Christ into your life, you have a testimony, you just don't understand the significance of it, right? Yeah. So spend this week to dig into the significance of what Jesus has done in your life. 
Secondly, if you're like, well, I've never given my heart to Jesus before, if that's not something you've never done before at the end of a time when we break, when we go to pray, I'm going to ask if that's something you guys want to do tonight, okay? So be thinking about that if you want to make a decision tonight to um, follow Jesus. Now, um, you see in your little uh, pamphlet, like, here's some guidelines, okay? Number one, this is not your story, but his story. Don't spend too much time focusing on who you were. I once had a guy give his testimony, and he spent 15 minutes talking about all the crazy stuff he did as a drug dealer, and then spent like 30 seconds talking about how he got saved at church. That's about you. That's not about Jesus. Okay, now most of you guys, I'm sure, don't have that testimony yet. Hopefully, I mean, not yet. I'm sorry. You will never have that testimony. Don't tell your parents I said that. Um, so focus on why Jesus has stepped into every part of your life, right? Yeah, so who you were before, how Jesus was still calling you in that time, right? I talked about that with my mom getting saved, right? Um, what happened when you got saved and what God's doing in your life now. You see how I did all three of those and Jesus is at the center. Keep it short. Don't go over five minutes. This is the most challenging part is about telling your story. Is It's not what to say, it's what not to say. I struggle so bad when I teach. It's the hardest part is what not to say. So you guys are going to struggle through that. Work on it with your parents, okay? Do it, start tomorrow, and then plan on Friday doing your first rough draft of telling your parents, okay? Because otherwise, Wednesday is going to come and you're going to stress, okay? So start on it tomorrow. Keep it short. Now, there is a version that you need a 10-minute and a 20-minute testimony, but five-minute people can handle I used to do this event called Fifth Quarter where we'd have like 95 to 120 kids show up to our church that weren't Christians. And every week we would do a testimony. And I would always tell them, do not go over five minutes. They will respect you. They will listen to you. But once you go over five minutes, they'll get antsy and they don't want to listen. Right? So people who are not Christians, um, they're not going to want to listen. And listen, when I was in... Um, Horizon School of Evangelism, when I went to Bible college, we had to have a two-minute testimony. And that's how we would evangelize. We would tell people our story on the bus or on the street and just boom, 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 boom. So I had a two-minute, five-minute, ten-minute, and twenty-minute version. So you guys can work on that too. Details paint a, paint a picture for your story. If you guys are looking on the other side, there's verses where Paul's giving his testimony. He gives details, like where he was, what it looked like. Did you guys notice the details I told in my story? Right? When I was talking about, you know, Wild Bills, Vacation Bible School, I didn't say, hey, so, like, I was four years old, I went to this Vacation Bible School, and um, they were talking about Jesus, and I raised my hand and gave my heart to the Lord, and, um, yeah, so that's when I became a Christian, and then, uh, like, I've been, been pretty much a good kid, like, my whole life. See what I mean? Like, there's a difference, right? I give you descriptive words. I talk about the blind, or the light, like, came through. Uh, I talked about um, what kind of my friend Samantha, right? You can put details if you know what details you're going to put in there without getting sidetracked. Now know yourself because some people, once they start putting details in, they're like C.S. Lewis, where it's like three pages of just describing the environment, all right? We, we, you're not going to be able to do that in five minutes, but get some key words, right? Details, paint, story. Don't speak in generality, speak in specifics, okay? So describe that. You have something to say just because you don't feel like it. Uh, Jesus loves you and he has given you a story. Um, don't just speak when you, when you go to give your testimony. Have something to say. Does that make sense? Like, don't be just like, well, Ryan told me I have to say this. So, like, I went to this camp and, you know, whatever. Have something that you're really planning on encouraging people. I did this in Borrego. First week, like the kids in the, the youth group, there was like three kids that were ready and then everyone else wasn't ready. And then once the kids that weren't ready saw the three kids that were ready, they're like, oh, I want to do this. This is really cool. It was really encouraging. So have something to say. Practice, practice, practice. The Marines have this saying, uh, sweat more, bleed less. That it, the harder you work before you get in the situation, the better you'll do. Um, back where where I was in Borrego, the, the pastor, his kids were amazing musicians, but he always say, I want to set you up to succeed, not fail. So if you're doing a bad job, I'm not going to put you in front of people because then you're never going to try again. You have to put the work in 
to be able to have the result. Practice, practice, practice. Then memorize it if you can. It will even go better. Um, body language, tone, and eye contact are super important. Eight, people will only remember 8% of what you say. 60% of what they will remember is your body language. <laughs> and then there's about 22% is your tone, how you say it. Like, I'm from California, and I was also from like a 90s, early 2000s kid. And so um, the word dude was used a lot. And how you said the word dude really described what you're saying. Like, dude, dude, dude. Like, you know what I mean? I said the same word, but if you guys are from, if you guys have been around in California, you know all three things I just said right at that moment, right? All about tone, the way that I said it. My body language also communicates a lot. So um, I don't want you to get too caught up in that stuff because honestly, content's more important at this point. But as you grow on it, remember that. I remember I was in Mexico and I was with my um, director and I was like, there's no way people retain 60% of your body language or that you can communicate 60% of what you want to say with body language. And he goes, oh yeah, and we're in this truck. And he waves to the guy next to him, and the guy waves back, and he's all, see, just did it all with body language. I was like, oh, that's true. People will recognize that. Um, pray. The most important thing you can do is pray. If you want people to be impacted by your story, if you want God to move, pray. Pray and pray again. If you want to be able to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, pray. You will remember things you didn't put in your notes. You will speak in a way you've never spoken before when you pray. But if you go in there in your own strength, I assure you, you will fail, you will struggle. But if you're praying about it, the Lord's going to do something beyond your imagination. It's so cool. Now, how do we break up our story? Okay, when you're now in the youth group, you probably don't have to do this because everyone knows you. There's five things. Your name. Like, so when I taught on Sunday morning, I did this. I went through my five things without you guys probably noticing. Hi, my name is Ryan Lin. I am the pastor of student ministries here at Solid Rock. I'm so blessed to be able to talk with you. I just need about 30 minutes of your time. I'd appreciate if you just pay attention. I want to be talking today about community and the importance of community. Um, I'm going to ask you to have your Bibles and your pens and papers and then we'll get, in, get into it. I did the five things right there, right? Name, credibility, time, content, expectations. It will resolve what's called cognitive dissonance if you ever get an opportunity to give your testimony because people are like, oh, how long is this going to be? Or why is this guy up here? So give why you're there, okay? At youth group, when you go to do it, you don't have to do that. We all know why you're here, okay? But those are the five things. And then write down these three sections. Who were you before you came to Christ? Most of you guys grew up in the church, um, but it, find that piece of your story. It might be your parents' story. It might be um, maybe you don't even remember. That's a piece of your story, right? Um, how did you, Christ come into your story? What was that? If there was a moment, use the moment. If you don't know the moments, describe the, the theme of what God did, right? Um, and lastly, what is God... Christ doing in your story now. Now, for some of you guys, you're like me. You gave your heart to the Lord at four, but it wasn't as significant as me. You grew up in church, um, but you had a set, what I would call like almost like a second conversion experience. I know many people have that, where it's like God broke into your life. In 2012, I didn't put this in my testimony, but it's another piece. Um, I realized while reading through the book of Luke that I was the Pharisee, <laughs> and I, the Lord broke me hardcore of my, my self-righteousness, and that was like a whole nother blossoming, like I feel like I'm blossoming right now and understanding the gospel. So.